Dear friends in Christ, this is our third uh, midweek Lenten uh, sermon. Uh, today we focus on sinful eyes that can deny, just like the eyes of Peter and the other apostles that denied Jesus. Uh, this Eyes on Jesus uh, series uh, focuses on the true eyes of Jesus to always be focused on the will of his Father and on the cross but as we learn of and from the disciples through God's holy will, a time of Lenten reflection for us uh, as well. Let us pray. O God, whose glory it is always to have mercy, be gracious to all who have gone astray from your ways and bring them again with penitent hearts and steadfast faith to embrace and hold fast the unchangeable truth of your word. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The first of our two readings is from 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 8 through 13. Remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, the offspring of David as preached in my gospel, for which I am suffering, bound with chains as a criminal. But the word of God is not bound, Therefore, I endure everything for the sake of the elect, that they also may attain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. The saying is trustworthy, for if we have died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. And then our Holy Gospel from Mark chapter 14, the basis of which our theme of denying eyes is based. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. And Jesus said to them, You will all fall away, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. Peter said to him, Even though they all fall away, I will not. And Jesus said to him, Truly I tell you, this very night before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. But Peter said emphatically, If I must die with you, I will not deny you. And they all said the same. And as Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came, and seeing Peter warming himself, she looked at him and said, You also are with the Nazarene Jesus. But he denied it, saying, I neither know nor understand what you mean. And he went out into the gateway, and the rooster crowed. And a servant girl saw him, and began to say to the bystanders, This man is one of them. But again he denied it. And after a little while, the bystanders again said to Peter, Certainly you are one of them, for you are Galilean. But he began to invoke a curse on himself and to swear, I do not know this man of whom you speak. And immediately the rooster crowed a second time. And Peter remembered how Jesus had said to him, Before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. And he broke down and wept. This is the gospel of the Lord. Peter said emphatically, If I must die with you, I will not deny you. I would never do that. Many of us have said that on occasion, maybe often thinking there are some things we would never do or could never do. But not long before Jesus died on the cross, because this is on the evening of Monday, Thursday, as they go to the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus tells his disciples, you will all fall away. Now back in the upper room, the 11 disciples and Jesus had sung a post-communion hymn, and then headed for the Mount of Olives. Now there were only 11 of them, uh, with Jesus because Judas had already departed to set up the betrayal of Jesus, get it staged. So as Jesus told the group that they would all fall away in fulfillment of the prophecy from Zechariah 13, 7, strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. Now their proud spokesman, Peter, though he was, thought he was exempt from this, saying to Jesus, even though they all fall away, I will not. And then Jesus tells him, warns him, reaches out to him, 
Truly, I tell you, this very night before the rooster crows twice, you'll deny me three times. Peter and all the disciples said the same. No, this is not going to happen. They tried to exempt themselves from his saying and denied that they would fall away. Now this was rather short-sighted, maybe even foolish, even as they were denying the very words of Jesus who was saying this was going to happen. But also having way too much confidence in themselves under circumstances that would be very challenging that they had not experienced yet. Jesus, three times during his ministry, had warned them and shared with them and predicted that he would be betrayed and arrested, that he would then be killed, and ultimately the promise of the resurrection. Now the fulfillment, the reality of Jesus' prediction is happening, and it's unfolding rapidly, but the reality isn't quite there yet. At least not until Judas comes with his betraying eyes and betrays Jesus, and then they find themselves where they do all run away. So what was in the eyes of the apostles as they looked upon Jesus, even as he predicted that they would fall away? Maybe it was first a look of kind of horror. Uh, how could this possibly be? It sounds so awful, just as we would feel too, to deny Jesus. Then a look of disbelief uh, as they begin to process this and got rather defensive and made their own protest about it. And then maybe even that little bit of slightly crazed, fanatical, religious fervor of saying that by my own force or by my own will, I can keep this promise or vow to God. Again, eyes on ourselves, eyes on our will and our accomplishment. Now, the reality, the eyes of the apostles weren't really seeing Jesus and letting his words sink into their ears or for their eyes to see themselves in their true humanity, their sinfulness and their weakness as they were focusing on their own perceptions, their own plans, their own expectations. Jesus had often said on occasion to them, as he warned them, that they had their mind on the things of men rather than the things of God. And so Jesus is always reaching out to them, to us, to be in tune with and have eyes on Jesus, eyes on Jesus' work on the cross, eyes for us to see the will of the Father and to be lifted up out of our own self, our own confidence, and have eyes on Jesus. The other ten apostles would go on to deny Jesus by falling away, by running away after Judas comes into the garden, after Jesus is arrested. That in itself was a denial of not only Jesus, but what they had said and promised to him they would do. They'd even gone on record saying that they wouldn't do this. I will strike the shepherd, says the father in Zechariah. It is ultimately the father like we learned a couple of weeks ago, who handed Jesus over, not, not just Judas, or as you heard last week about the Father's will that Jesus drink that cup of wrath on the cross. And it really takes us back to Isaiah 53 and the Father's will to crush the Messiah so that the, all people could be righteous in God's sight. Hear from Isaiah. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was a chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. Jesus was struck down on our behalf. The Father struck him down, but to raise him up again. Because we want to be reminded that the fullness of what Jesus had told the disciples was not just that they would all run away and deny him. But this word of promise when he says in our passage from Mark, But after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. His words about their denial and running away did come true. But how much better the good news of the gospel that his prediction of his resurrection 
and his appearing to his apostles would truly happen. And we then anticipate in the Lenten season that that will be our ultimate joy as we worship, as we remember Jesus' resurrection on Easter. But now what about Peter? He had fallen in such a spectacular fashion. Now, first of all, I would point out that it seems he was the only one that had the courage to get even close to Jesus' trial. There is that bit of Peter in him to draw him into that, besides John. Uh, apparently John was uh, on the scene as well. But we see this dramatic fashion that Peter denies him, and it strikes me that it was a bit of a cross-examination. He was on trial himself. Think about that. He was on trial whether he was going to confess that he knew Jesus and who Jesus was or deny that. And notice it's a little servant girl or a young servant girl that is cross-examining him. So Peter's night gets worse. As he goes into the courtyard outside where the trial's at, he's not there walking up to people and defending Jesus. He's not speaking in Jesus' defense. He's staying quiet, observing. And this servant girl recognizes Peter and says, you also were with the Nazarene Jesus. Peter said, no idea what you're talking about. Two more times it happens for others that recognized him and about the bystanders and the others around him. Peter didn't say, I know of Jesus' miracles. I know of his teachings. He is my Lord. I am following him. But even as he made his denial and remembered what Jesus had said, we find that he had true contrition and demonstrated by his weeping bitterly. He cried and he cried over his sin. Now, we also may think we would never do such a thing. But how many times have we stood by silently when someone spoke words contradicting the Lord's word? Or how many opportunities have we had to confess the gospel to others and have passed them up for fear of giving offense? We understand the importance of joining Jesus on his mission and the faith that he creates in us to be bold and faithful and have eyes to see Jesus the Savior and eyes to see where Jesus is at. And then it's also a good Lenten example for us to follow Peter's example when he expressed his true contrition over his sin, what he had done. Unlike Judas, who did not really have a change of heart and turn to Jesus and dealt with his guilt in his own way, Peter had true godly sorrow over his sin and it prepared him beautifully for the absolution, the forgiveness that Jesus would give him on Easter when Jesus appeared to the apostles, showing them his hands and his feet and saying, Peace be with you. Even later on in Galilee, after Jesus' resurrection, Peter got a special singling out an attention that left no doubt in Peter or the other apostles' mind that he had been restored even though he had been the denier and actually placed in the position of being a confessor, the same role that God empowers us to be in. At the Sea of Galilee, Jesus showed up for a breakfast on the beach with some of his disciples, and there Peter gave, Jesus gave Peter a threefold admonition, probably to balance the threefold denial, about feeding his sheep. He finally says, follow me. And he says to each of us, from an earlier passage in Mark, if anyone would come after me, Jesus says, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? Now, it's interesting to those denying and doubting apostles, Jesus entrusted the teaching and the baptizing that would go out to all nations, and to turn others that deny God or don't know God into confessors, into followers of Christ empowered by the Holy Spirit. Through our baptism to Christ, we have been given a gift greater than the whole world. We have lost our life in this world for the sake of Christ and then found our new life in him and his kingdom, where we are truly saved because of Jesus' salvation from the cross his victory over sin, death, and hell. And we also are looking forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. 
God is indeed with all of us to help us speak up for him, to have his eyes to see. And when we fail, God will forgive, just like he forgave Peter. Because Jesus does keep his promise to love and forgive us always. And he keeps his promise that we will forever be his own forgiven children. In his name we pray. Amen. May the peace of God that passes all understanding keep our hearts and minds in true faith unto life everlasting. Amen.